Okay, from the studios of the Ram Cave, in the home of Camellias, I'm Joe Tarosian, and this is the Burbank Faith Virtual Good Morning for July 27, 2023. As always, we are praying for our young people. Today, we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Again, uh, application, not necessarily Bible study. This is episode number 101 of A Ministry Without Parole, and uh, thank you for tuning in. I actually tagged some folks today, and... Uh, I don't tag people anymore when I do this because who wants to see me in their stream all the time? But uh, if we could bear with me through the application, we do have a couple of serious prayer requests that have come in, and that's why I tagged you. Uh, if you're affiliated with us a little bit, not everybody, but I, I just tagged some people uh, because uh, we did have some serious prayer requests come in. I just want to make you aware, and, uh, and so it won't be a regular basis of me tagging you. Okay. You hear the ambient background noise. It is my air conditioner as we are in the throes of a major Del Scorcho here in SoCal. And, uh, and let's get started here. Second Peter chapter 1, just verse 16. That's the only one. This is Peter giving a defense uh, for the apostles in what they're doing and what they're sharing. And he says it brilliantly. Second Peter 1, 16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's pretty cool. Uh, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Pretty good writing for a fisherman. Um, the story, uh, the, the, the word story there, we didn't follow in cleverly invented stories, translates into the Greek word muthos, which is mythos to us, how we would pronounce it. Fable, tale, fiction. So he's, what he's saying is, he says, we didn't make this stuff up, man. This is stuff that was there we didn't make any of it up. Good morning, Kelly McCoy. Thank you so much for clicking on. Also remember this. Uh, this might have been 2,000 years ago, but these people were less foolish than us. Uh, we don't <clears throat> verify anybody or anything. Somebody has a complaint. Somebody has a charge. Somebody says uh, plastic straws are destroying the ocean and he's nine years old and we jump on it. We don't question the rationality behind anything anymore. Um, and uh, but in those days they did they did question things they, they looked to see if they could expose people if what they were saying wasn't true you know even the Pharisees in their weird sort of way did uh, serve a purpose to some degree in terms of no you didn't quote scripture right there um, even though many times they went off on the beaten track as well but uh, here uh, Peter is saying hey you know what uh, I'm going to defend ourselves here. A little, little, little bit of, becomes a little bit of an apologist. And many times throughout the New Testament scriptures, there is testimony about witnesses and before many people seen and many people saw Christ. Some who are still alive to this day. You hear Paul and the writers making reference to that kind of stuff. Also, another thing to think about these believers and these apostles is um, they endured hardship and persecution. Uh, no one is going to willingly die for what they know is a lie. People might end up dying for a lie, but uh, they are going to believe it's truth, but they're not going to die for a lie. Hence Peter making up the argument here. We didn't invent these stories. We didn't invent these stories. He defends himself and the others uh, when he says we shared with you about Christ. He's saying we were there. Three different gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, by different writers in different periods to different audiences give an account of the transfiguration of Peter, James, and John being present on what most people believe now is Mount Hermon. And, uh, and Peter was there. They saw the majesty of Christ. You know, they were there. They saw Elijah and Moses. They saw this. Three different accounts. Now, you got to remember the Bible wasn't being written when it was being written. It wasn't being written to follow a certain narrative of like, okay, now Peter, you wrote yours, John, you wrote yours, you, Matthew, you wrote this. Now, these were all written at different times, and they were circulated, and it was the church later on that put these accounts together. So these are separate accounts lending to, their, lending to their veracity that what Peter is saying, that we didn't invent this stuff, we saw it, um, that it's true. Why is all this important, you ask? You didn't come for an application on on terms of apologetics, but why is this important? Well, when you take to the time to visit a church, contribute time and finance to a church, 
you better make sure there's not some fire-breathing heretic in the pulpit looking like me or sounding like Andy Stanley. Uh, there's a concerted effort, and this is by intelligent evil, because there is an enemy out there. Peter calls him the devil. There is intelligent evil out there working against us, and there's a concerted effort by that evil to appeal to the vanity of our scholars and our theologians to disbelieve what scripture says. Now notice, I didn't say our politicians. I didn't say the Satanists out there. I didn't say that about the atheists out there. No, there, there's the, the, an intelligent evil appealing to the vanity of people who would, would identify themselves as part of the church, as scholars and theologians, and this, 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 this vanity is, uh, is drawing them in uh, and, and they are coming to disbelieve what the scripture says because maybe they want to look smarter in the world's eyes or it appeals to them that they've got some new approach. Uh, but they are very destructive within the church and they would dismiss much of the stuff we're reading about in scripture these days, especially this, because this comes from Second Peter and they want to dismiss everything but the gospels or just the red letters. So we've established that those who surrender who give in to that vanity, they're bums. Okay, now the question boils down to what about you, what about me, right? How, how, how desirous are we to know more about the Word of God? How critical is it to us to, to really discover what the truth is? Are we willing to go back and study the, the, the commentaries and the Greek and everything? Um, it's, it's vitally important. I can tell you, um, I've always been into my Bible, I've always trusted my Bible. But spiritually, I feel like I didn't take off until my Bible started to look like this. Until my Bible took on the appearance of, of, uh, of just being used constantly. Uh, and not for my vanity, but to humble me into thinking what I thought I knew, I didn't know. And I had to study more. When I started out in ministry, my office was in the basement of the gymnasium. When I was studying or prepping for a sermon or a Bible study, I literally had to get up from my desk, go up a flight of stairs, walk across the courtyard, go into the church office, hope my boss was not in a meeting and his door wasn't closed, and then ask him if I can go into his library to borrow a commentary. I did this probably for my first three or four years as a youth pastor until people donated me, uh, donated to me their own uh, commentaries after retiring and stuff. So I had some older ones. Uh, but that's what I had to do to get an answer. These days, 30 years later, with a point and click of this thing on my computer or just a little few swipes on my smartphone and a tap, I have all the information that was in my boss's library four years ago and more, all of it ready for me to consume, uh, available for us all to discern, defend, and demonstrate the truth of scriptures. Now, this is an old Joe T saying, but it's still true. You might get sick of hearing me repeat this, but uh, let me. Uh, let me share this. Too often, people in the church, people around in different places, you let me and people like me decide and do all your Bible study for you, right? Because you trust us so much. Well, I think it should be aware. You're seeing the Andy Stanleys. You're seeing the, the other folks out there. Uh, you need to test everything, and you have no excuse anymore because for as much as you might hate this technology, uh, God has given it to us to, uh, to be able to, to, to ferret out the wheat from the chafe, to, to get the truth from what is false, right? And that's how heretics and, her and heretical theology prospers, when we don't study, when we don't do our due diligence, when we just trust. And it's not anything outside the church that's destroying the church, it's the apathy inside the church that's diminishing the scriptures and thinking that we've got something smarter. Right? We've got something better. Uh, now, I'm going to go one step further with this because I love this passage here that Peter says. Again, the fishermen, right? We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay? Uh, so, one step further for me, I'll share this. Personally, I never followed cleverly invented stories. Uh, and because of this, I have seen the majesty of God. Oh, come on, Joe, I know you're saying, like you've seen something equal to the transfiguration? Well, maybe not, but if my own life stories, my own life testimony isn't good enough, I could tell you I've seen the majesty of God in the lives of young people breaking the change of hopelessness thrown upon them 
uh, and those chains breaking at the introduction of Christ. I've seen it happen with kids. I've seen it happen with adults who suddenly had their lives redeemed when they thought their lives were going nowhere. I've seen it a few times in a church sanctuary. I've seen it many, many times at camp or in a plowed over Mexican cornfield or in a small village. I've also seen it during a simple evening Bible study where someone came to understand that they were really saved no matter what churchianity tried to dictate to them. That we are saved by a believing loyalty in Jesus Christ. This is what we want for our young people. To the truth of who Jesus is reinforced by the authority of Scripture led by the Spirit. To tenaciously study and come to love the Word of God and become battle-hardened and ready when they leave the mountaintop or the safe environment to possess the grit to stand for the Lord when all in their world are disagreeing with them, to develop the ability, not by emotion, but by knowledge of the truth, to avoid any conformity with the sensibilities and hopelessness of our present culture, to be optimistic for the future, so that when they're, when face to face with the spiritual hostility of this world, they will be alert, unmovable, unshakable, and undefeated in him, and absolutely terrifying to those opposing Christ in the spiritual realm. Looking alone to Jesus, living in his strength, they will always be victorious. And that's why we pray for our young people. Amen? Amen. That's why we pray for them. Good morning, Mr. Stewart from the Ridge and everyone else that's clicking on. Hey, we're going to get to some prayer requests here. I just want to share just a brief thing here. If you're an adult and... Uh, you're thinking, hey man, I just need a little more Bible, just like what I was talking about. Or maybe God's calling you into the ministry, but you're thinking, hey man, I'm in my late 30s, I'm in 40s, I've got a mortgage. I can't just run off to Point Loma or a Bible college or seminary. Well, the Los Angeles District Training Center might be just what you need. The LADTC is offering online classes this summer, and they offer online classes throughout the year. And they can get you that little bit of training that you might want or get you started in a new journey where God is leading you if it is into full-time ministry. Reverend Eloisa Redeen is running that and I can put you in contact with her. Reach out to me and we'll get you in contact and get started today at the Los Angeles District Training Center. Okay, a lot of prayer requests folks. Uh, we want to get these out. I appreciate you clicking on and sticking with me through that. Dee Dee McCoy, thank you so much for clicking on. Okay, uh, Orville Lewis, we brought him up yesterday. He is the father of Ken Lewis. Uh, Ken and his wife Paula pastor the church in Ridgecrest great church great history I knew Orville Lewis back in the old Rosemead days when Ken was youth pastoring there and uh, Orville and Joyce Lewis live in Idaho Orville took a bad fall and the situation is not good um, so please keep Orville Lewis in prayer he has many uh, other issues besides just this fall also one came in just before we came on the air today uh, there's a young man, about five years old or so, young 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 boy named Bodhi Seitz. Um, and I share this with permission, we've received permission from his parents, that there's fear of a possible brain tumor that Bodhi might have. And uh, so there's going to be some testing done. And uh, we, we need to be in prayer for him. But we need to be in prayer for the whole household. His parents are Rob and Maddie Seitz. They are fantastic workers at Granite Ridge. If you've been there this summer, you've likely ran into them. And uh, we just need to pray for this family. And we need to pray for Bodhi. And we need to pray also for his sisters, Lily and Addie. Lily was actually part of our Outsiders Kid Camp. And if you were watching my posts, there was a little girl that was doing the opening and closing of her face and sticking her tongue out at me. That's Addie. That's Bodhi's younger sister. So please be in prayer for Bodhi's sight. So we'll keep you updated as best we can. Be in prayer for his parents, Rob and Maddie and uh, his sisters Lily and Addie, the doctors, the nurses, and this journey uh, that we pray is a short one that, that Lord, you touch this young man's life and uh, you be with him. Be with the staff at Granite Ridge as they, they come alongside, Shea Stewart, Tracy, Zach, everyone else as they come alongside uh, the site's household. Uh, so Lord, we just ask for that. Uh, and, uh, and then we ask for a woman named Donna, who had brain surgery and she's having some post-surgery complications. This request came in from uh, Burbank Faith Virtual member Vivian Huerta. Also, if you're a longtime Burbank Faith member, I, I can't share. These people are in fine health. They're, everything's good with them and their families. No, no emergency there. 
But uh, just remember Shauna and Lisa. And uh, if you're part of Burbank Faith, you know who Shauna and Lisa are. Just lift them up. Uh, pray for a young boy, Rafi, who's been visiting us, that if he's just with us for a short time, that he hears nothing but the truth and affects his life down the road, or he's with us for a long time. Uh, we just want him to be blessed. Pray for the Trollinger household and the passing of their father, Bill. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Holly Randolph. She is the sister of Julie Randolph, who goes to Ridgecrest Church. Um, Holly had a major health crisis and is basically learning how to walk again and all the rehab stuff. Corey and Christy, who live in uh, NorCal, going towards the Nevada border, the recent loss of their son, Seth, to a fentanyl overdose. They are devastated, be in prayer for them. Our good friend, John Strickland in North Carolina, Frank Griffin in Texas. Shea Stewart's grandfather, Richard, who was on Comfort Care in Las Vegas. Juliet Trotman, whose next surgery is pending and coming very soon. She is the wife of Hari Trotman, who is the pastor of our L.A. Grace and Exposition Park Churches. The Garmans, as they leave uh, into retirement, we pray for Greg and Leslie. We pray for Mark and Debbie Lehman, our new district superintendents on the Los Angeles district. Continue to pray for Jan, our 87-year-old Marine. Those battling diabetes, Victor Storms and Ronnie Maldonado. We pray for Piper Morris and her son Grayson, uh, who's battling crab leukodystrophy. Uh, Megan Meeks. Uh, with um, kidney and liver disease. Uh, we pray her MRI goes well and that uh, there's good word for her from the doctor that she follows up with. Pray for our friends in the great Northwest, Darlene Carroll, her friend Thea with her family issues, Kathy Duncan, whose health is not good, and Ralph battling COPD. Pray for the Lynch household. Uh, pray for John, whose vitals are good, but he's not doing well in terms of responding to his family. Um, Family's feeling in limbo, be in prayer for John and Barbara Lynch uh, as uh, he needs a liver but he can't have the surgery right now. Be in prayer for them. Uh, Denise, Jan Hart's cousin, had a correction in her meds. We praise God for that and she is much improved. Our cancer patients, um, my friend Dion Nizzi up in Oregon, uh, getting ready to be tested on. It doesn't look like he's going to have to have surgery, but it looks like it's going to be radiation for lesions on his spine. Rachel Gilbert, Randy Medina facing neck surgery next Wednesday. Uh, Enrique Romo, Colby Van Dyke, and Emmanuel, and of course our good friend Tim Burns up there in that Nevada, Cali area, and we pray for him, and as he's in one form of his cancer, he's in remission, another form he's still doing some battling, but he's in good shape right now. Pray for him and his wife who are dealing with COVID. We pray for Vision Paradise, their ministry, our future Armenian ministry, and we pray for Burbank Faith, and yes, we want to pray long term, but we also praying short term that this Sunday is spectacular and that this Sunday is awesome uh, and also we do pray for Granite Ridge and this uh, new thing let alone working camps <clears throat> but this new thing coming up with Bodhi sites and the sites household <clears throat> so uh, let's be in prayer and uh, then we'll get you on your way I'm not worried about time today I went a little longer uh, Lord we do pray for these folks on our list Lord we pray for our young people Lord that we as leaders, teachers, preachers, police officers, soldiers, uh, uh, politicians, athletes, all those in positions of influence, Lord, that we would hold the line on our faith, that we wouldn't be tempted to gain standing in the world's eyes, but that we would be the perfect example, the best example for our young people to see so that they could develop this tenacity, this grit, to trust in your word and to discern and decipher when hot garbage is being fed to them, even from the pulpit. Lord, we pray for our young people today that they would develop a relationship with their word, with their Bible, and trust in you. Uh, Lord, we pray for those on our list. We pray for the Lewis household, Orville Lewis and Joyce. We pray for Bodhi Seitz and his whole family as they have begun this journey, Lord. We pray for Rob. We pray for Maddie. We pray for Lily. We pray for Addie. And Lord, just bring peace to that family. Invade this space. And Lord, we pray for Bodhi, God. Uh, just, Lord, mend what needs to be mended. Fix what needs to be fixed from head to toe, side to side. Bless this young man, Lord, uh, and, uh, and Lord, we'll give you all the glory. Uh, Lord, we pray for the doctors and nurses that he'll be coming in contact with in future weeks. Give them wisdom, and uh, Lord, we just again ask for your touch. Lord, we pray for Donna, um, friend of Viv Huerta, who's having complications after brain surgery. We pray for Shauna and Lisa. We pray for Rafi. We pray for the Trollingers. We pray for Holly Randolph. We pray for Corey and Christy. We pray for John Strickland and Frank Griffin. We pray for Shea Stewart's grandfather, Richard. We pray for Juliet Trotman. We pray for the Garmans. We pray for the Laymans. We pray for Jan, our 87-year-old Marine. We pray for Victor Storms and Ronnie Maldonado. We pray for Piper and her son, Grayson. 
We pray for Megan in Las Vegas. We pray for the people in, up in Washington, Darlene Carroll, her friend Thea, Kathy Duncan, and Ralph. We pray for the Lynch household. And uh, Lord, we pray for that awkward space they are in right now, Lord. Be their peace through this hurricane. Lord, we just thank you for the good news on Denise, and we continue to pray that her recovery and everything is going well. Lord, for those battling cancer, Lord, we pray for Dion Mizzy, uh, Rachel Gilbert, Randy Medina, Enrique Romo, Colby Van Dyke, and Emmanuel. We continue to pray for our friend Tim Burns. We pray for Pastor Walter, Pastor Francis, and Edgar at Vision Paradise. We pray for a new Armenian ministry at 505 South Street to reach our neighborhood. And Lord, we pray for Burbank Faith, that it is a great Sunday, great uh, message brought by your spirit, not by me, and that great worship brought by your spirit and not by the talents of Pastor Bill. Lord, let us uh, be thinking about that, Lord. Let folks be dwelling on the opportunity to come to your house on Sunday. Lord, and we also pray for Granite Ridge, as well as the Sites family, Lord. We pray for Granite Ridge as they are ending one camp, beginning another on Monday, and then another one uh, after that. Lord, be with them during this busy and now stressful time as we pray for the entire staff and everybody there. Lord, we do thank you for loving us. We thank you for the hope that we find in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, folks, I apologize for going so long. A little bit different today. But I'm going to let you go. We'll download this. We'll share it around. Be in prayer for that family. Uh, and we'll keep you updated as best we can. And remember this truth. Those of us who have a believing loyalty in Christ, those of us who are not moved by the social winds, we are the revolution. We are the counterculture. We are the ones who fight the establishment that is based in the, in the corruption of this world. We are the revolution. God bless. Take care. And uh, I will talk to you soon.